So we are looking at story number 155, Fearless Confession. All right? And uh, keeping in mind what we're dealing with here, we're still going through Jesus' time when he is now walking through Jerusalem with the understanding that he has people that are looking to do him harm. He's been questioned and, and uh, talked to with the purpose of trying to trap. He's been invited to dinner, um, and then, but not invited because they wanted him to be there to, to share his fellowship, but he was invited there so that they could question him and set up different types of scenarios and trap him in his words. So this is what he's been dealing with, uh, and we're gonna continue on in this as we look at this next session. So let's go ahead and get started. Story number 155, The Fearless Confession. Take a listen to that. Story 155, Fearless Confession. Therefore, do not fear them, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, and nothing hidden that will not be known. Because whatever you said in the darkness will be heard in the light, and what you spoke to the ear in the inner chambers will be proclaimed on the housetops. What I tell you in the darkness, speak in the light, and what you hear in the ear, Proclaim on the housetops. And I say to you, my friends, do not fear them who kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. And after these things, they do not have anything more to do. But rather, I will show to you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after killing, has authority to destroy even soul and body to cast into Gehenna. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Are not two sparrows sold for one Assyrian? Are not five sparrows sold for two Assyrians? And not one of them will fall on the ground without your father, nor is forgotten before God. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. And I say to you, therefore, everyone, whoever would confess me before men, the Son of Man will also confess him before the angels of God and my Father who is in heaven. But he who denies me before men, I will also deny him before the angels of God and my Father who is in heaven. All right. So we see this, this statement of the fearless confession. And if you remember you know, several months ago, we were dealing with um, uh, these multiple opportunities that came about where Jesus was pointing out how we should not have fear. We should not walk in fear, live in fear, operate in fear. And one of the things that we tried to point out was oftentimes we try to um, make the, the, the great enemy of like say love well, the, obviously, the enemy to that would be hate. And, and oftentimes, if you look at scriptural uh, definitions, uh, it would not totally agree with that, that the opposite of love would be hate. Because love still, still shows an aspect of connection, just like uh, hate shows an aspect of connection. You can't hate something that you're not connected to. Right? So, therefore, there is some feeling there. But fear uh, is the thing where you want no connection, you fear, you, 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 you have a dread, and that really is the, the thing that if, if the devil can get an emotion out of you, that's the one he wants to get out of you. So God's trying to get us to activate love, uh, and Satan is trying to get us to activate fear. So when you look at uh, this whole mindset, how many times have Jesus told us not to fear? And here he is again telling us not to fear. And, and when you look at this and you go through scripture and you, you start accumulating all the various topics and, and the density to which this, a certain topic is discussed and talked about, fear ranks up there amongst the top. So there must be something to that. The Lord doesn't want us to fear. He wants us to what? Trust him. But how do you trust him? You have to trust him with the understanding that he loves you. All right? And so therefore, if you, if you have fear, 
That means that you're thinking something's going to happen to you that is against what you would think would happen to, uh, to you if somebody loves and cares for you. So therefore, uh, if you know God loves and cares for you, wh why would you fear? Now that's the, the basic equation. You wouldn't fear. And the psalmist, uh, David picked that up when he said, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. You know, yea, uh, though I walk through the valley of the, of the uh, uh, shadows of death, I will what? Fear no evil. So that, that whole aspect of not fearing is important. But how do we actually learn to apply that? Well, we learn to apply that through relationship, which is why we have to have Jesus as our own personal Savior. So when you know that no matter what it is, God's got my back. He's, he's, he's going to cover. He's got me in his, uh, in his mind and, and in his agenda. I'm part of what God is trying to do. When we understand that, and that's the whole concept, we can say it that we know God has all things, but then can you bring it personal? He, underst he, he has all things, but he also has me and my agenda and my activities. And then no matter what comes about, because there are things that we will see in this world that can produce fear. But can we learn to just, well, Jesus is my Savior, so I will not fear, even though the evidence tells me that I probably should. Um, and we talked about many examples. Uh, we often, one of the ones that I point out a lot is when Jesus was in the boat, when he told them we're going to get in the boat and go to the other side, and the big waves came about. And the, the disciples who were, who a majority of them were professional fishermen anyway, and they knew what it was to, to have a bad storm. They weren't exaggerating their fear, these people that are used to being on a boat, but yet they were afraid. But then you look at what was Jesus doing? He was sleeping. He was taking a nap. And so uh, they woke him up and said, do you care not that we're going to perish? And then he, he woke up and said, oh ye of what little faith? You know, Because why? He told them we're going to get in the boat and we're going to go to the other side. So that whole aspect of, to me, that's in a nutshell of how we are. The Lord told us we're going to come through this world and we're going to end up in heaven if we trust in him. Now, in between that, that statement and getting to heaven, there's going to be all kinds of winds and waves and stuff but, and that are generally ingredients to produce fear, and worry, and concern. But can we go through and allow our everyday life to be more and more of a training aspect to where we learn to trust God more and more every day? And that is how we produce growth. And so we see here, once again, we're dealing with this. And so this uh, story 55, this fearless confession, opens up and says, Therefore, and this is right after he had uh, said woe unto the Pharisees and the scribes and the, and the Sadducees. He says, Therefore, do not fear them. And that's the, that's, uh, the them is, is who? Scribes, Pharisees, Sadducees, whom he previously has described as what? Hypocrites. He says, so don't fear them. For there is nothing covered that will not be revealed. All right? Why? Well, he told them that they were hypocrites. That means that they outwardly look like one thing, but inwardly are what? Something else. Um, the, the problem with a hypocrite is that a person wants to have people see them as one thing when inwardly they are something else. And what the Lord is trying to get us to see is we uh, the, the whole aspect where the scripture says... Um, if we confess our sins, he is what faithful and just to what to forgive us of our sins. So the 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 thing that we have to remember is that we should not. Good morning. Good morning. We should not be so concerned about trying to present ourselves as something perfect, but we should present ourselves as something that needs Jesus. One story, one fifty-five. Um, and that, that is the, um, the thing that oftentimes that we don't like doing. We don't want to do. We want, we want to have our outward facade as being, well, you know, this is what, you know, I'm, I'm all together. I got everything well. When the Lord tells us that we should admit that we have issues and seek for him to give us uh, grace and mercy and deliverance. Um, and that's part of the... The, the personal relationship that you build when you know who Jesus is. 
So when he was talking about the them, he says, and, um, because the things that they do, though they be covered, they shall be revealed. They shall be shown. Um, showing us, this is why you shouldn't fear them. Because you think they got so much going on and so much better than you, but they're not. These scribes, these Pharisees, these Sadducees are not better than you. As a matter of fact, they're worse than you. Because at least you admit, and you recognize your shortcomings, but they try to hide their shortcomings. And once again, we can go to another illustration that Jesus gave about the two men that went down to pray. And one went down and prayed and said, Lord, I think you're not like how this guy is. You know, he's an extortioner and doing all this other stuff. And he goes, I, and he talked about all the stuff that he did about him praying and giving and all this other stuff. But then the other man got down to pray and he said, Lord, be merciful to me, a what? A sinner. Jesus said that that was the man that got up justified because he wasn't being hypocritical praising himself, he recognized I got issues and I got problems and I need God's mercy. And that is really what we should be doing uh, on our day-to-day -day life, that we should not try to hide our shortcomings from the Lord, but admit to the Lord that we have them. All right? And so he says, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and nothing hidden that will not be known. So all this is going to be brought out. So why cover it up anyway? God knows. Right? So therefore, when you have issues, you say, God, I got issues here, and I need your help. That's what God wants us to do. Uh, and we lean on him. Because whatever you say in darkness will be heard in the light. God's going to bring it to light anyway. All right? So, I mean, when, when, you know, when somebody stands up and says, I got a problem, are we shocked that somebody might have an issue? No, because we are all born in what? Sin, shaped in iniquity. So you're born one way, and then the, this world that is a sinful world shapes you and reinforces your sinful nature. All right. So therefore, we got to go against the grain and, and get into the Word of God. Well, God will then say, yes, you were born this way, and you were uh, the, the nature of the world trains you to continue going that way. But I'm going to show you how to go in the opposite direction. I'm going to show you how to receive greater uh, 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 honor through just taking on a righteousness that you could not earn. And that's by receiving who? Jesus. All right. And then he says, and what you spoke in the ear, uh, in the inner chamber, will be proclaimed on the housetop. So what is he saying here? He's saying, don't, don't try to be too secretive about the fact that you got issues. Now, does this mean you want to put all your information out on in the public and just tell everybody what you got going on? No, that's not what it's saying. But what it's saying is you need to make sure that when it comes to you and the Lord, that the Lord uh, uh, is, is aware, well, not so much that the Lord is aware, the Lord is always aware, but you are proclaiming to the Lord what you know he already knows. Lord, I got issues here. Now, when you confess it, which is what the Lord tells us to do, and the Lord tells us to confess them to who? To the Lord. All right? But then there's also the scripture where it says, confess your faults one to another, which means you've got to be very what? Careful to whom you can confess them to. All right? Uh, you don't want to confess it to people in the street. You need people to who you know that will what? Understand and help you to just get uh, uh, through and learn how to overcome certain issues that we bring to everyday life. All right. So he goes on with this, though, and he says, what I tell you in darkness. So now he's saying now even the things that I tell you that, that um, are in closed rooms or, or I tell you, you know, one on one uh, speak in the light. He's like, not even the things that I say to you should be kept secret. Everything should be what? Proclaimed. So the fact that Jesus is, is said that I, I'm come to to to. Uh, cover all sin you understand it but I want you to tell everybody let everybody know that Jesus covers all sin so someone, someone says I got a problem with this and there's nothing I can do about it well there may be nothing you can do about it but guess what you don't have to be held accountable for it really yes really all you need to do is just believe that Jesus uh, died for that sin and then take on his righteousness but he goes on and what you what you hear in the ear proclaim on the housetop 
All right, so once again, that's just reiterating what he had already said. When you understand the things that even that Jesus tells you, when the things that the Holy Spirit speaks, then you go ahead and you proclaim it. So when that whole aspect of nothing that is, that is said shall be held secret, whether it's good or bad, that's the whole aspect of nothing. It all will be proclaimed. And I say to you, my friends, do not fear them who kill the body. All right, so now he's saying, now to add to that, can you eliminate that fear of the human body, the death of the human body? And that's something that is hard to overcome. A lot of times this is where the struggle is because, you know, we often proclaim, and we talked about some of those famous stories. We talk about, you know, one of the most famous stories in the Bible is the story of the Hebrew boys. Remember that, right? They, they, uh, the king says, if you don't bow to my image, I'm going to cast you into, the, into this furnace fire. And the Hebrew boy said, well, we're not even going to take a whole lot of time to think about it. We're not going to bow to your image. Now, I do know this, that our God can deliver us. But whether he chooses, chooses to deliver us or not to deliver us, we're still not going to bow. Now, obviously, those Hebrew boys must have knew that there was something greater than their natural life. Because if natural life was all there is, then you, you will do all you can to do what? To preserve it. But when you recognize that natural life is not all there is, there's more to it, then you're not worried about it. Now, for instance, um, when we, I say we, when, when man, in the form of Adam, was created, he was created uh, in a way that I could not explain, but I can give a hint that it was greater than how we are now. Adam had more than what we have. Now what that more was, I can't give you any tangibility. One thing that I will say is that he probably had greater dimensionality. All right, we do recognize through our science that there is a greater dimension. And so we know that he, even from our aspect that we can see naturally, but it's hard for us to grasp and to hold on to something spiritual. Spiritual right now there's still something that is more abstract than solid to us but I think in Adam's time when he before his sin spirituality was more tangible to him All right? and so when, when the Lord told Adam that when you eat of that fruit the day you eat of it you will die when he ate of it instantly something happened to him because it says that their eyes were open and they saw that they were what? They were naked. So they lost something, whatever covering, whatever they had, it was gone. And then they instantly recognized. Now, they still had something remaining, which is this three-dimensional reality that we live in now, that we perceive now. And that was passed, been passed down to us. But he lost something when he ate. And then even this, this three-dimensional reality that we live every day now, at some particular point in time, even that what dies. Now, if you recognize that this three-dimensional reality that we live in is really just a very small representation of what really exists, and when you, when the three-dimensional reality actually dies, you go back to the fullness. We go back from time to what eternity. Now, I'm saying all that to say this. This is where your aspect of not having fear can be harnessed and can grow. Now, the greatest, the, the best example I can give, and I've used this before, of showing the difference between what we actually are and what we see ourselves as now, and I'll use dimension as another uh, uh, description. And when I speak of that and I say the word dimension, the Bible calls it what? The spiritual realm. Well, scientists today call it dimensionality, which I, I think is a good phrase to help us today. Now, in our world that we live in today, we are three-dimensional, but we can see ourselves in two dimensions. And that's through what? If you walk outside on a sunny day, what do you see on the ground? Your shadow. Now, your shadow, you can, you can get a ruler, and if it's on a flat ground, you can measure your shadow from left to right. See how long it is, right? You can measure your shadow from, from where you're standing to all the way out. Because it has, what, some size. But, how, but can you pick that shadow up? Can you fold that shadow up on itself? Can you lift the shadow up? You can't because it, even though you, it has some reality this way, 
has some reality that way, it has no reality to come up. Because it, 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 cause in order for it to come up, it would have to be, it would have to enter into another dimension. A shadow is trapped in two dimensions. It cannot enter into three dimensions. It's locked. Just like how we're locked in three dimensions. And that's why we can't, we can't move up into the spiritual realm at will. We have, we have the spiritual realm kind of glimpsed at us. Every now and then, God gives us the miracle of peeking into that spiritual realm. Now, if you have a shadow, and even if on a sunny day, when the clouds come over and the sun is covered, what happens to the shadow? It's gone. The shadow dies. But did you die? No. It was just the shadow. So you come in a room that's got a lot of bright lights and you got your shadow cast on the ground and somebody comes in and turns out the lights. Your shadow what? Gone. But are you gone? No. Okay. So when the, when the cloud comes over the sun, are you fearful? No. You're not. You're not worried about your shadow because you know that shadow's not really you. The shadow is just a representation of you. The same thing about this body. This body is a representation of the real you. And you will get to see the real you when you do die, or if God gives you a miracle to be able to see it, as he's done in some of the other characters in the scripture. Because that's like, okay, um, time has stopped. It's like time, when, once time stops for you, then this natural 3D three-dimensional realm that you live in no longer goes forward and you, and you move instantly, instantly back to who you are. But you get to see who the real you is. You see? So now you go up into a greater dimensionality or greater spirituality. All right? So therefore, when you understand that, that the spiritual realm contains the real you, not this realm, the fear then can lessen. Okay? There is no way I can tell you that you should not do anything to protect your body because that would not be correct. You do want to take, protect your body. You want to do what? You want to be, be healthy as you can. You want to you know, uh, do the things that you have to do. Even God says it. I know that you need these things, which is speaking <coughs> of, of food and shelter and clothing. But at the same time, know that that is just a representation of the real you. Just like a shadow, it's representation of the real three-dimensional you. But you are a spirit. You are a spirit being. This person that, that you see in the mirror now is not the whole you. All right? It's just a shadow of the full you. And I think it's important that we point that out. Because oftentimes we, we, we've been taught to go through this life with so much focus on it has to happen now. This world's got to have it all. And yes, you know, we all want, you know, uh, the good health. We all want the, the good job. We all want the nice uh, family structure and, the, and the, you know, the car and the house. And we, that, There's nothing wrong with that. But with knowing that, understand there's what? Another level, a greater level. And then that will help to lessen the ability for the devil to place fear into your heart. Because if he makes you so fearful, and that's why people, you see people that are very wealthy, excuse me, <clears throat> people that are very wealthy and have a lot of things in this world that are not happy. And you often wonder why. Because that's not where true joy comes from. It doesn't come from those types of things. And people will say, well, you give me that money and let me find out for myself. You will find out. <laughs> you will. Because if you can't be happy, you know, with ten dollars in your pocket, you ain't gonna be happy when you got, you know, a thousand or ten thousand or a hundred thousand or ten million. More you, money, more problems. More money, more problems. That's it. That's it. It just amplifies because now you're trying to protect and hold on. If you don't if you can't Find a way to take what little bit you have and be happy and be helpful to others. Then when you get all that, 
It's harder to protect if you're trying to hang on to your ten dollars and you're trying to make sure oh, ain't nobody gonna take my ten dollars. Oh, they're not gonna charge me too much interest over here. Oh, they're not gonna charge. Well, you trying to do that with your ten dollars? How much work are you gonna do when you got ten million? Too much. Um, you're gonna be going everywhere and you're still trying to still trying to protect that same little ten dollars. But that's not where your focus is. Your primary time focus is on. There are different kinds of gifts that you have. More focus is on that exactly. So, if you can be happy with the things of God now, then God can bless you and you can still be just as happy. Right? And uh, that's where we have to recognize. How blessed do you feel you are now? I mean, just think about it. I got up this morning and um, I turned on my, my uh, water in the bathroom and it came out hot. You know, I was able to uh, get me something to drink, open up a refrigerator. The refrigerator was cold. You know, <laughs> I'm able to take a shower and, and put the temperature just right. I reached over, got some soap. I mean, now think about what I'm saying now, and think about all the billions and billions of people that have lived on this planet. They could not do that. Mm -hmm. And then when I got ready to, to you know, I, I got in the car, started up. I didn't have to walk here. I didn't have to feed no oxen and get on no horse. I just got in the car and drove right on over. I got in here and I opened up the computer, got right to the scripture, got to, got to my book, and I couldn't really see it too, too clear because I was kind of fuzzy, put my glasses on, everything looked clear. Look at the world we're living in. You can't be happy with this? Do you know how many people on the planet, even today, they would, uh, if they would say, well, in order for you to have what this person has, you have to chop off your right leg and left arm. And they'd be like, do it. Because of what you got, so what are we going? What are we really fearing then? What are we afraid of? Why are we worried? Has God lived up to His promise? I will take care of you. All right? and, and and when we struggle and when we go through, God's there. He's with us, and He told us that, didn't He? He said, "I will what? I will be with you when? How? Always." He also said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So not having fear is a biggie. It's a biggie because oftentimes the devil tries to make us look like we don't have. And that's the biggest lie he tells. What you don't have. He's trying to get you focused on what you don't have. So because you're driving a Kia and somebody else comes come by a Toyota, then I ain't happy. Well, I've got to get me a Toyota. Then the Toyota guy he ain't happy because he sees somebody come around in the BMW. And the BMW ain't happy because he sees somebody come around in the Mercedes. So it's what? That's, that's how the devil wants us to, to, to focus and wants us to think. And that produces frustration and worry and fear and anxiety. All the things that the, that, that the devil wants us to have and what Jesus is telling us, don't fear this. So look what he says. Read this again. And I say to you, my friends. What did Jesus call us? His what? Friends. His friends. Do not fear them who kill the body. Right? That shadow of the real you. Don't fear them. But are not able to kill the what? The soul. They can't touch the real you. Right? They can get rid of the shadow. They can turn off the lights and the shadow can go away. But they can't affect the real you. They can't touch your soul. And after these things, they, they uh, do not have any more to do. Right. So if you were to lose your natural life, and this is where the Lord is trying to get us to see. Um, because you lose your natural life does not mean God's not with you. See, and that's where people, that's the lie that the devil wants to do. Well, he got hit by a car, God must have, how, why did God forsake him? God didn't forsake him. You remember the, the, in the last uh, uh, lesson that we saw, remember when he said, um, when he told the, the Pharisees and the scribes and the, and the Sadducees that they're gonna, they, they are going to be responsible for the blood of all the prophets. All right? And we saw that in Luke 11.51. Uh, uh, he says that the blood of all the prophets uh, that is poured out 
from the foundation of the world might be required of this generation. And in 1151 of Luke it says, from the blood of Abel. That's all going all the way back to Cain and Abel. Alright. To the blood of Zechariah who perished between the altar uh, and the house. Now, obviously, God knew, we know God knew about who? About Abel. God knew about Zechariah. This guy who, who these uh, scribes and Pharisees and, and Sadducees killed. Now, God saw it. And he let the natural body do what? Die. But did God forsake Abel? Did God forsake who else died like that? Paul. Peter. Did God forsake them? So the death of the natural body is not evidence that God has forsaken you. God says, I will not forsake you. I will always be there with you. And how he, we, how he is with you during those times, I cannot answer. But I will say this. If God, during the time that you are taking your last breaths, if you are not aware that God is with you, then that makes Jesus a what? A liar. And he is not a liar. So even the absence of this of, 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 of being on this earth is not evidence whereas the devil wants us to make wants to have us to have that false assumption that if God allows you to die he's not, he's not with you he's not for you when in reality that's not true now do we do all that we can to preserve and to do what we need to do yes we do because God has told us to, res to be uh, respectful and responsible for life. But then life is ultimately in whose hand? In God's hand. Because I don't produce my own oxygen. I don't make my own sunshine. I am not in control of that. I don't produce any of the stuff that, that allows life to happen. God does all that. So therefore, he is the one responsible for life. All right? The things that I create, I'm responsible for that. Well, what did I create that, that brings life? I didn't create anything. All right. I'm responsible for uh, uh, living up to what God has called us to do. All right. um, and we go on. But he says, But uh, are not able to kill the soul, and after these things they do not have anything else more to do. But rather I say, uh, let me say this again, but rather I will show you whom you should fear. Now, this is the person that you should fear. And unfortunately, in our English uh, 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 scripture here, uh, we see situations where we're using the same word. This fear is not a fear of, of I'm scared and running away. This is a fear of what? Of reverence. Mm -hmm. All right? And it's funny that the, both the word fear and the word love, when we look at it in our English translations, both of them are not broken down in the proper sense. Uh, love, we, we, can, we, can, we can definitely see that it should be four different types of descriptions given about love. Uh, from agape to filial to uh, eros to sorge. Different types of love. And there's also different types of fear. So let me show you who you should feel, who you should reverence. Reverence of fear him who, after killing, has authority to destroy even soul and body and cast into Gehenna. Right. Now, this is where you need to understand that, the, that God has the authority to not only deal with the shadow you, he can deal with the real you. All right. And he's the only one that can do that. There is no one else that can. All right. So that's the one to whom you look and say, that therein is the ultimate authority. He is the one that deserves all recognition. Only God. Now, the devil would like us to want to be upset with this. Why should God have control over who and what you do? Well, once again, who made <laughs> Who made us and who made everything that is about us? God. So, yes, he is the creator of all. And, the, and yes, he is the one that, that has all authority. And you, you can't be upset with somebody that says, I'm going to give you life. But yet, in the life giving, if he gives it, he has the ability to do what? Take it. To take it. Right. 
And so what uh, Jesus is saying, if you want to have some awe and some reverence and some concern about what it is that I need to be focused on, here is where you need to have it. About God. What does because see, what the devil thinks about you don't matter. What I think about you really don't matter. But what God thinks about you is big time. Because God wants to, if God sees you as a, sin, as, a, as a sinner or a son. Because if he sees you as a sinner, then, then you will go to where sinners go. Uh, and he says he cast them into Gehenna. Now, uh, let me share this with you. This is just a theory. This don't have to be true. This is just me thinking. And uh, I, I think a lot about stuff like this. When I think about Gehenna or the lake of fire or hell or all that whole aspect, my mind looks and says, okay, now, obviously when Adam died, because him and Eve ate of the fruit, they were stripped and, uh, of, their, of some of their freedoms and some of their, their abilities and reduced to... to be locked into this three-dimensional world that we kind of live in now. All right? And I can see, and as I pointed out to you, a two-dimensional world, which we see every day. We see, the sh we see shadows all the time. So two dimensions, we can see it. We know how two dimensions operate. We know how it works. We know what it can do, what it doesn't do. And sometimes we don't even pay attention to it, but there it is all the time, right in front of us. What about one-dimensional? Shadow's two dimensional. Mm -hmm. One dimensional. Now, suppose if God says to you, I don't want you to eat of this fruit, and if you eat of it, the day you eat of it, you're going to go down a dimension. In other words, you're going to die. You no longer will be three dimensional, you're going to be two dimensional. And now you turn into a shadow. Mm -hmm. And all you are, and you, you will feel what? Trapped. And you always running to make sure that you're staying in front of the what? The light. Because the minute the light, you don't have no more light, what happens to you? You die. Now that's a, that's a two-dimensional world. And, and there's a lot we could point out about that two-dimensional world. Uh, that how it will, would be if we had to actually live in it. There's actually a movie that came out years ago called Flatland. And if you go on, if you go on YouTube, you can find it. It's, it's, it's about how the world would be if we were two dimensional people. It's called Flatland. But what I think about was that you, you heard of something called the, the bottomless pit. Right? That's described as where people go that don't believe in who? Don't believe in Jesus. Well, what is a bottomless pit? And I thought about it and I said, you know, a bottomless pit would be a one dimensional place that because if it's one dimensional I mean it only can go in what one direction for how long forever it's just it's just one dimension that's just always going and never ending so I said wow I wonder if the bottomless pit is you being reduced to a one dimensional being this just, just he strips off two of the dimensions and then, okay, you don't want to, you, you were in the three-dimensional realm, try to show you about the greater dimensional reality, the spiritual realm, but since you didn't want that, we're going to reduce you then to a singular dimension, which would mean you would be in, you would be in one spot, always what? Just, just moving. It's like, see, we move in three dimensions. But we're moving, what's moving us? What is the thing, what is the, the, the funnel that we're going through? We're going through what? Time. And so this one dimensional would just be going through time, but you can't go left, right, up and down. You're just going straight. All right. And now. Sounds like life. Hmm? Sounds like life. To a degree, but very limiting. Extremely limiting. Now. Let me go back and say what I said before I said this. This is my own imagination. <laughs> but I'm using my imagination in a sense of trying to understand what the Lord is telling us. It could be that. It, it, it could be something totally different. All I know is I don't want to be that. I don't like the limitations and the frustrations of this three-dimensional realm. 
I truly believe we would we were our mind, our spirit were meant for more. And look, do you ever get that feeling that this 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 can't be the it? It's too much wrong. It's too much. So so even our spirit that's in us knows this ain't it, and it makes you what frustrated sometimes. But yet we still recognize that even in the midst of all of that, God has still did what blessed us. Imagine being in a two dimensional or a or trapped in a one dimensional reality. Yeah, I think that that yeah that would be hell. Now, am I telling you that that's what hell is? No. But what I'm telling you, what I'm trying to get you to do is to think and to use your own imagination and to see that whatever this Gehenna, this bottomless pit, this lake of fire, and all these things are that, that have been described as the places where people that say no to God and no to Jesus are uh, destined to go, what it could be. And, uh, and that, ain't, that ain't a nice thing, is it? So again, is the lake of fire or the whole bottomless pit? That's what it's called? Well, yes, there are um, synonyms to that. There are two places that, was, that is described um, hell. Actually, there's three. There is um, um, there is the the paradise lost, or the or the, the 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 place where the rich man died when he when he died, which is called hell. Remember, mm -hmm. Jesus told the story that the, the the poor beggar Lazarus he died, and then um, he went into Abraham's bosom, which was described as what paradise. But then when the rich man who didn't have any compassion on the beggar when he died. Jesus said, and in hell he lifted up his eyes. Now that was described as the the holding place um, where, and, and yet he was in what? Torment. It was a torment. Now, when Jesus was raised from the grave, he went, and all of those people that were confined into Abraham's bosom, which was the good side of, of, of the paradise, he led them captive and took them where? Into, into heaven. So I'm thinking they were still in, in, in Abraham's bosom, meaning that you're still in, your, in, in, in a limited state. But once Jesus actually paid for sin, sin being paid, he can now take you to your greater state, which is why he led all those people. And that's why the scripture says, open wide the everlasting doors. Who's going to come in? The king of glory, the Lord mighty in battle. And he brought all of those with him. Um, and then you have the lake of fire, which is described in Revelation, where those that are in hell will eventually be cast into. And that then is where we get the aspect of being uh, in a bottomless pit all the time, seeming as though there's no ending to it. Um, and, and there are many different words that are used. And then once again, and this is another problem that we have with our English translations that we combine a lot of phraseologies into singular words so you have to, it would actually make it, it would be a good study when you go through and you look at all the various definitions of holding places for the eternal state and uh, you would get a lot out of it and, and by no means do I have the exhaustive uh, um, list of that but it's important to know that all of these places seem to have a a a sense of limiting and confining and and great sorrow. They all seem to have those things in common. Alright? So, the key is what? Don't go there. That's the key. But, yes, there is a lot, uh, Mother, that we can, we can glean from that. And then, um, unfortunately, you know, you can go grab... Um, you know, one of the uh, the sources, or or go online and look at all of this. You'd be surprised at how many different phraseologies that are being used in scripture. Uh, which is why even this individual, uh, when he wrote this uh, Merge Gospel, he used the word Gehenna. All right, um, and in other um, versions, the word is used as uh, uh, hell, and um, and I'm sure other versions use other words. And this way, I have a, a Bible that is called, that's called uh, the Parallel Bible, and I like using that because it shows you all the different 
variety of, of uh, verbiages that are being used for certain words. I don't have it with me today, otherwise I would definitely look it up because you would see that there's a lot of ways of using that word. But the, the key is, don't allow yourself to get uh, um, real evidence as to how it actually is. You don't want to go there. All right. So, he goes on and he says, yes, I say to you, fear him. Who's to him? God. You fear God. And, and, and are not two sparrows sold for an Assyrian or, you know, for, for, for a very low price? And are not five sparrows sold for two Assyrian? You know, are still a very low price. So what he's saying? Sparrows are what? Not expensive. They're not valuable. But look what he says. And not one of them will fall to the ground without your father knowing. All right, so not one of them will fall to the ground without, without the father. In other words, he's what? He's aware. He knows about every bird that what? That falls. So if he's aware about the birds that fall and, and that, that die in this natural world, how much do you think he's aware of you? So what is Jesus trying to get you to see here? God is paying attention to you. The father is with you. He's paying. You are not a side uh, conversation with God. You, you're not, well, yeah, I got, I got my main thing here and then I got my other thing. Here. God sees you as a main attraction. You're not the, you're not the, you know, the side show. You're not the intro band. You, know, you are the main attraction. Each and every one of us. God has you in the focus of his mind. And so it's important that we see that. Now, if you know that and understand that and believe that, how do you feel about your everyday walk? <laughs> God, and now, if, he, if you know he's there and he's all focused on you, doesn't that make conversation real easy? And I, I, I've learned that. You know, I'm not, sometimes at my job, when something comes up and I don't know, I say, hmm, what, it's a long, what should I do here? And I'm, and I'm not saying it as a, out of phraseology, out of just being clicheous. I'm saying it because I, I, want, I want a response. I want, I want help. And we learn to do that when we believe it. Do you really believe that God is paying attention to what you're doing right now? He sees you at a point where you try to make a decision and he, he knows that you need to make a decision. And, and we wonder, well, what should I do here? And that's a great time to, to talk to somebody that is focused on what you're doing. And that's who? That's God. That's right. Can I say something? Mm -hmm. One of the things I've learned over the years is that when you put all of your trust, not partial, in Him, you automatically start talking to Him. Mm -hmm. and, what, and you don't have to speak the mouth where people mm -hmm. hear you. It's in here. Mm -hmm. And you'll be surprised that if you spend that time with Him, talking with Him, and just waiting, just you have to wait. He'll answer every word mm -hmm. you ask. Yep. As long as he knows it's for your benefit mm -hmm. and not for your personal, right. you know, situation. Yep. People are like, I want a Cadillac. Yes, That's exactly. not what he asked you. Like, he'll give you a bike and do the same yep. thing. Mm -hmm. But that's, I learned that from a yep. bike, okay? <laughs> Close enough. But the thing is, I learned that because sometimes you get caught up in you. Mm -hmm. And you forget that it's, it's all about him, mm -hmm. not about you. You're serving him. He's not serving you. He's blessing you. Right. And it took me a long time to, to understand that, that leave this portion alone, that's mm -hmm. the world, and focus on that. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's when you said about the dimensions. I was just thinking, as my notes, I was just thinking, that next dimension we're talking about, is about heaven mm -hmm. because once we was reading and we talk about he gave us a peek by rolling back the heaven mm -hmm. so we could see yep. that this was real mm -hmm. uh, and i just thought about that when you said it about the different dimensions i said yeah that's what he was talking about mm -hmm. okay just yep. check with that yeah and so it's important that we recognize that that god is with us and therein is our ability to really let go of fear when we know he's with us all right. So he's not just with us. He's also with us in what? And he's aware. He's focused on what we're focused on. All right. But let's go on. And he says, uh, nor is forgotten before God. Speaking of what? Those 
those uh, those spells. Right? Reading read this reading that in conclusion uh, connection here, it says not uh, not five spells sold for two or seven, and not one of them will fall to the ground without your father, nor is forgotten before God. All right, so they're not forgotten, but uh, even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Now, so not only is he paying attention to you, he knows you more intimately than anybody can know you. So it's not that he knows, this is not saying he knows how many hairs on your head you have total. All right? That's not what he's saying. He's saying that I know each hair. I know what number that hair is. I know which one it is. All right? Is that hair follicle number you know, 442, or in some cases like me, you know, 22. <laughs> you know, so it's like he knows every hair. Now, if he knows the hair, what else about you does he know? Because how, I mean, hair, we, 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 we shave it off, we cut it off, we do it. It, it's, it. it comes in what? comes in goes. But then what else does he know about you? So, I mean, he knows what? It all about you. So he knows your makeup, which is why. You see, if I ask you, well, how many hairs do you have in, in your head? And, and if you pull one out, I go, which number was this guy? <laughs> you can't answer that, can you? No. Now, that's why when things come along, because God knows you better than what you know yourself, and because you think you know yourself, and when option and and you know you got. Come up to to a day where you got three options: option one, uh, one, two, and three, and you go, "I want option one." But because God knows you, He will block option one and and kind of gear you towards option three. And then when, when you end up having to go through option three, you go through options three, sad and complaining and fussing and and crying and some more God's not with me and good. Because you knew that if it was God's will, if God wanted me to have this, I would have had option one. And you just got the tears, and, and you know, I'm not reading my Bible no more. And, and you know, but yet God knows you, and knows that option three was best for you. So as you go along, and as time goes forth, and then you start looking back, and you say, you know what? I'm glad I didn't get option one. I am so glad that didn't that didn't happen. I'm, I'm thankful for option three. God knew. Alright? So, because, how, why does he know? Because he's more intimate about who you are than you can even know about who you are. He knows you. He knows every hair that is on your head. Alright? He goes, e he goes, but even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. Look at what God said. Look at what, look at what Jesus is telling us. He goes, if God knows about every sparrow that falls to the ground, and then Jesus is saying to us, you're more valuable than the sparrow. Now, there's some people today, these, these animal uh, rights activists, that will tell us that, no, a human being is no, not more valuable than a sparrow. A human being is not more valuable than a dog. A human being... Because see, you can, if you, you can abort a baby today. But if you go up and get a eagle's egg and abort that eagle's egg, ooh, you go going to jail for a long time. <coughs> for a long time. All right? So, I mean... You you go out and you you take you do you, you you know you can you can kill infants before they're born, but you can't kill some of these these animals. Now you know you 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 go and take a dog and abort the puppies of a dog, and and you're gonna get arrested. All right. Uh, but that that's another topic. I can go I can go on with that. But that shows you how. But we can see here. What did Jesus say? Do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. All right? So you're more valuable. That's from God's point of view. 
Right, so we, you better, you, you, God has put more into us than He's put into the what? Into the animals. Now, does that mean that we should mistreat animals? No, no, that's not what He's saying here. So some people say, well, if you if you make man more important than animals, that means you can mistreat. Him. No, that's not that's not what Jesus is saying. All right, and the people are saying, well, we shouldn't be doing certain things, and, and no, no, it's, it's it's not saying that. All right, uh, the, the disciples were all what fishermen. All right, they caught fish. Jesus ate fish. He boiled fish himself. All right, so keep that in mind. All right, and it says, and I say to you, therefore, uh, everyone who uh, ever would confess me before men, the Son of Man will also confess him before the angels of God. Now, what is it saying? If you trust and believe that I'm su I'm who. I say I am, and you trust that about me, and you let people know. One of the reasons why I don't fear is because I believe that God has got my well-being in focus, and so I learn not to fear. Now, with me saying all of this, right, and you ask me the question, so wait, do you ever fear? You know what my answer is? Yes, I do. You know why? Because I'm I'm still imperfect. I'm still I'm 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 not I, I I'm not full of all that God can 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 put in me. But what I am aware of is my weakness of fear. So then, what do we do with our weakness? Do we do like the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and try to hide it and pretend that we're not? No, that makes us a what? A hypocrite. We admit our Lord. I <laughs> I gotta admit, Lord, I'm, I'm I got some fear here, but I know I shouldn't. So help me, Lord. I know I shouldn't fear. I should know that you're here. But I still fear. So I, I acknowledge that I shouldn't, but I know that I do. So that means that I must need Jesus. Just like Paul said. Paul said, when I know to do good, what happens? Evil is present. So I know what to do. But I'm still feeling the, the wrong feelings and the wrong attitudes. So therefore, I know I need what? I need help. And where does my help come from? It comes from the Lord. All right. So, uh, we, um, whosoever would confess me before man, the Son of Man will also confess him before the angels of God. And my Father who is in heaven, well, this is who else he would be confessing you before. All right? But, he who denies me before men, I will also deny him before the angels of God. Alright. And my Father who is in heaven. So what does this mean? It means if you if you don't trust in Jesus, that means that you have you are doing what? Trusting in something else. Well, what did Jesus say? Jesus says that that I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. And the life. There is no other way to the Father except by what? By Him. So if you don't trust in Jesus, He can't confess you. Because how else are your sins going to be forgiven? And so therefore, when you, you, can't be, you can't be presented to the Father because the only thing that can be presented to the Father is an individual that is perfect. Because remember, God is what? Holy. We cannot mistake the holiness of God. There is nothing imperfection. Wrongness cannot enter into the personality, into the being of God. It is anything that is wrong is always what? Consumed. Right? It's like fire. You can't put just anything in fire and expect it to come out right. You can't put paper and wood and, 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 and cotton and stuff like that. And hay and stubble in fire It's going to be what? Consumed Now you can put some gold in there It's still going to melt But it's still going, when the fire is done What? It's still be gold So that's why Jesus talked about When, uh, when we bring our, our, our righteousness our, 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 our works Will be tried in the what? In the fire in other words, They'll be tried in the presence of God So therefore they have to be works That have the um, the, the constitution, the, the makeup, 
that is equivalent in the spiritual realm to gold, fire, to gold and silver and precious stone. So therefore, if you don't pre pre confess Jesus, he can't present you. He has to what? Deny you before the Father. You can't be, well, you know, bring up, you know, uh, uh, Jack James. Oh, uh, well, he can't come up. I have to deny him because he has not accepted me. I don't know who Jack James is. I just called the name out of it. <laughs> but I'm just saying, um, you want to be able to be presented before the Lord. All right. I took my time on that. I thought I was thinking we was going to get through maybe a couple more. But I said, well, you know what? There's a lot of good little points in here. Let me make sure that we bring those out. And I'm, I, I do have the tendency sometimes to be a little long-winded you know, on a specific topic. So uh, God help us with that. But uh, we do thank God for that. Any other comments or questions on what we talked about today?